obviously most of you have met me now. Um, and then this is Dan Freeman. He is the nurse uh, educating community outreach uh, person from the trauma service that's been coming with me to do all the ceasefire things so that you guys can get a sense of um, we have the support of the trauma service with this new protocol so nobody kind of has to get nervous. The, he'll talk a little bit about that at the end to let you know how the trauma team feels about this. As of today, once you're trained, you're good to go starting today with this protocol. Um, we don't have to like roll it out and wait, you know, count, you know, three times and click our heels and stuff. After I'm done, you're ready to go. Okay. Um, so we're going to do this. Is it's, I'm calling it the selective cervical mobilization. Uh, the state would not let us call it that. We had to call it what all the other stuff is in the book. So it's, it says cervical immobilization slash clearance. You're not really clearing anybody. You're choosing to to immobilize certain people. That's what this comes down to. Now, um, this is the way we have always boarded people for the last, uh, I don't know, 30 years. Patients were, if they were walking and talking, but they crashed their car, they got tied up seven ways to Sunday. This we are now no longer going to do any more of this. This is the sweetest thing in the world. We're waiting like my whole career to see this happen. This is where my career started. This was my first ambulance. <laughs> no, I don't, I'm only kidding. This is my, really my first ambulance. I've never one. Um, you know, in 1977, as you can see, the two of us sat in the front. The patient got loaded in the back. We didn't carry backboards or oxygen. We didn't worry about that stuff. And we're kind of going back to that now. Oh, the old days. All right, so here's the protocol. We're going to go over this in pieces, but I just want to go through a couple of other things. The objective of this protocol is to get the patient off the board. Get the patient off the board. So you may need to use the board to move somebody from point A to point B, but it is considered a, a set of handles is what it is. All right? We're no longer leaving people on boards for your long ride into the hospitals to wait until somebody else can get them off. As you know from the hospital, you come in, they don't even take your report. They just unclick all your stuff, roll the patient, pull the board. And that's what we're going to have you do as well. What we know about all the research that's out there, the board actually serves no purpose and actually causes harm. Okay? All right. So that is the objective of this whole thing, is how do we get the patient on the stretcher without a board? Okay. Some things about cervical collars you want to know. They say that among the severely injured trauma patients, 14% of the, all of the trauma patients in the everywhere that we are. 14% will have a cervical injury, but only 7% of them will be unstable. That's not a bad number. Of the remaining 86% of the people we take care of, a collar will provide no benefit whatsoever. 86% of the time you go out the door. That's almost all the time. Okay. Ultimate goal of management is to prevent further neurological injury in the setting of an unstable fracture. Now what happens with ATLS which is the physician level course for PHTLS. Um, they are the ones that are mandating EMS use cervical mobilization for all trauma patients to protect them during transport. What will happen with ATLS is they will be like the rest of the medical community, they're going to be five years behind. So when you take PHTLS, they're going to be still be advocating board collar, you know, all this stuff. It's not going to show up in curriculum for a number of years, so be aware of that. National Registry is aware that this is now rolling out. I don't know what they plan on doing with it, but we'll see as uh, over, over time. So what do we know about cervical collars? Well, in the unstable spine, when testing, what they did was they took cadavers and they, um, they cut through the spine. And then basically they measured how much movement was involved when you applied a one-piece collar and a two-piece collar. And there was far more movement with two-piece collars than a single collar. So that's how we ended up with our single collar. This study also showed that the soft collars, the ones, the old ones that we used in the 70s, were as good as not having a collar at all. And that of all the collars that are out there, the Miami J and the Aspen collar were the second best to the number one that is best that we would never use in the field. I'll show you a picture of it. So these collars are subpar. Philadelphia collars are worse than these. And soft collars are worse than everything. Okay. Um, in this particular study, it also showed that unstable uh, cervical spinal injuries um, during application of removal, removal, removal of cervical immobilization collars, there was a lot of motion. And really, this is a hard screen to see, but what it's saying is that it tested 
six different motions in the, in the um, person that they cut the cadaver and then they try to apply these collars to see what motions were worse. And of course, the, the flexion and extension, you have about a 1% or a 1 degree change when you're trying to apply collars. And actually, flexion and extension are, is the motion we care less about. That's the one thing we really don't worry about, although somehow that gets translated in our classes that don't let them move their head. And so flexion and extension is okay, especially when you're intubating. The other um, motion that they were looking at was rotation, which is also not that serious of a motion when it comes to the cervical spine, because that actually happens at the axis and not the rest of the spine. The one that's most dangerous to the patient that we try to prevent is the side bending. That's the one that causes all the problems. So when they did that, they said, the conclusion on this thing says, <laughs> oh my gosh. Basically, it's telling you that with uh, changing of the collar, there is still some significant movement when we're using one piece and two piece. So, let me just show you a couple of pictures that I, these are pictures from Roanoke since I've been there. I have over a hundred of these. And I meant to send these to Janet Blankenship recently because she wanted to use them for class. But I want you to just look at the collars yourself and I'm going to ask you about what's the general theme of the collars. So first of all, we can see what's the problem there, right? Big gap not really doing its job. Um, and, and just so you know, nurses are not allowed to touch the collars, so what you'll see here is these are collars that when patients get undressed, this is what they're left with. Nurses don't touch them. It's not like they've been taken off and put on by a bunch of people. It's left the way it is and they cut around things, so be aware. Okay, and then I just took a picture from the side, just so you can see the big gap, and I don't know if I was, I must have been shaking or whatever, God knows what. Um, so again, I don't know what you see is the common theme. Here we go, um, got this big gap underneath here, and then that's her chin, and this is holding her nose up. <laughs> um, that was brought in that way. I just want to point out some other things. If you haven't noticed the first two collars, see where the piton is right there on the bottom? Do you see the locking mechanism completely wide open? This is her from another angle. I mean, that's really doing nothing to help any of this whatsoever. Um, I almost had a head bleed when I saw that one. I've got a couple in here I saw. Here's one where the guy was um, cervical collared with his necktie completely up, tie, you know, shirt all tied up, everything buttoned and uh, bordered around that. Now, the interesting piece that I didn't point out before, but you can see this collar is under his chin. Boy, but it's way under the chin. Um, he came in screaming that he can't breathe, and this plastic piece that's here is pushing on his vocal cords. What do you notice? Oh, the red pito in the same position, and oh, we're unlocked again. All right, another collar. Once again, we've got this big gap in the back, doing nothing for the patient. Where are we? Low position, unlocked. I have a hundred of these pictures. My first year at Roanoke, 2011. Here I am, brand new resident. I'm all excited about everything. I watch these things come in, and I got collars up to here. I got collars on sideways. I got big gaps. I got, and I was like, what? This is a grown man wearing what? A pediatric collar. Low position, unlocked. This thing was choking oh, this poor guy. I'm telling you, when I took it off, it was, it was indented. And I said to the firefighter who brought him in, I said, um, handsome, you know when I call you that, you, there's going to be something, right? I said, hey, handsome, who put that on? He goes, I did. I said, you know that's a pediatric collar, right? He goes, yeah, that's all we had on the truck. Like he was annoyed like I was asking him. So I said, I took him by the hand. I said, come on, let's go for a walk. That you never want to do, okay? That is not appropriate. Here we are once again. This is a critical patient that's been intubated again. Got big gaps here. Oh, here we are, low position, we're unlocked. Uh, here's a lady, again, look at the big gaps all that are all in here. Big open gaps. Oh, low position. I know you're surprised at this. This is another patient, pretty critical. Big, huge gaps in here. And luckily, they left this thing unlocked because they had a place to put the oxygen. That's what a lot of places use that locking mechanism for, to hold their oxygen. That's so, why you got the white piece in the back. Hey, can right you there. can lock that with the oxygen tab in it. It does lock still. Hey, I know. I know. <laughs> Some people are pretty ingenious. So basically, um, these are the kind of the calls that are out there. You guys remember the old Phillies and when I said, I have seen these things put on upside down and backwards, and I am completely blown away when I see that. 
The writing is upside down. It says back and it's in the front. The front is in the back. It looks like a big tulip. The head's just hanging out there. You're like, ha, ha, ha. never mind. Don't answer. <laughs> okay, then we came up with the, uh, the stiff necks came out first. And they were white collars and there were four colors. We had purple, we had um, blue, and then we had orange, and then we had green. And when I called Laird all and say, what's the number one size collar that's ordered by any service in these old stiff necks? Everybody ordered purple. And the only reason I know that was I would work where I worked as a nurse, we would have to, after we took the patient off the board, we have to take all your EMS stuff out to a cabinet. And you go out there and on the floor, there would be 40. No neck cervical collars out there, and not one other color. And I was like, well, there you have it. Now, the aspen is what we use in the hospital, but once you bring them in in one of these um, extrication collars that are not very helpful, and we're not going to be able to clear their C-spine well, we will change this in the trauma bay to protect them a little bit better until, if they have a problem, they'll have Virginia prosthetics come in and measure them from one of the special aspen turbo ones with all the bells and whistles. And then this is the show me, the one that I said is the top line, but I can't imagine us carrying that. And I don't know too many patients we get the straps around anything. So, and then here's another form of some of the collars that are out there. Every company's gotten into, into their thing. Now, what I know about EMS in the short 30 something years I did this is that collars came out, we started off with one, and then they changed and they turned them from the soft collars to the orange rubber that looked just like your CIDs, the head blocks, it's that same foamy stuff, that was the next collar. And then they came out with aspen collars, they said take those off, we're not using those anymore, uh, use these. So you know, we would take them all out and go, oh yeah, I see how those work. At, stiff necks came out and they said the state says they want you using these, get rid of your, uh, your um, Philadelphia collars. So they handed us all these collars, they said here put them in your bag, which we did. We never got a class, we never got anything about it. And like most EMS people, I used to blame it on the men, but now there's plenty of women in EMS that we can't blame it on the guys anymore who won't, who won't read directions. They just take it out and they go, well, I'm pretty sure I can figure this out. That doesn't look that hard. And then next thing you know, we're all using them wrong because nobody's been taught. So the first thing I wanna do is make sure we understand there is a way to measure these. And with this new protocol, if you're gonna be putting it on somebody now, it's because you think that they actually need to have the protection, therefore the collars have to be on correct. Okay? So we're going to take the boards away, but make sure the collars are on correct. So, the measuring scheme that goes with these, how many were actually taught to measure these? Two people? Three people? Good. That's better than most of my classes. Most of them go, oh, yeah, we're going to teach that stuff. The cool thing is the collars, um, they come with instructions right on the bag. Sometimes it's embossed right on the collar. Uh, same thing with here, it's on the bag. But, or it's embossed on the collar, and this one is embossed on the collar. So there really is an excuse, but we're going to review that today. So can I, you want to bring yourself over here sure. with a chair? This is the important thing to remember, Sorry. is that there's two lines that we are trying to make sure we measure when we get to the patient so that we can match it to the cervical collar and we get the correct measurement. So with that being said, this particular collar, the one you have, as you know, the, the top piece goes up and down. You're adjusting the chin to make this fit in the, in the right position. Now when you want to measure a cervical collar, the important thing for you to know is that your hand has to be going forward towards the nose. So you cannot do this because you need the fingers to make the measurement to the collar. So they're sitting in a car and you've got to come up and put your hand. If they're lying on the floor, you've got to put your arm down on the floor and you've got to bring your hand so it's going towards the nose. The two measuring points are going to be trapezius muscle is point one, and then the second point is the line under the chin, and this is the space I'm trying to fill between my index finger and, and the chin. So by doing that, if I, if I put my hand down and I line up the chin, the bone, not the chins, like some people have, these are chins and these are boobs, <laughs> the chin like where the bone is, what you want to do, you want to be where the bone is, you would then go ahead and, and Line this chin up, and how many fingers am I uh, matched up with? At least three, right? For this particular person. I then come to this collar, and in this particular collar, it says the sizing line is right here. So the three fingers that I use to measure would have to be this one, this one, and this one. So I can take this one out of the picture. 
I come over to the collar and I would lay these three fingers on the measuring line and what I want to know is what hole is open that has to be filled with the red button. That's how I decide which collar it is. And this one just happens to be on regular. So I have to drop it down on regular and then I have to lock the thing into place. Okay, that's, that's the first thing is just getting the measurement correct. So lining your finger up to the measuring, the measuring line and finding out what hole is open and that's the hole you choose that fits his size. Okay, then obviously we want to curl the collar and we want to kind of break it out of its flat position. The next thing, when we put these collars on, they have to be on the patient. So when you put them on, we can't have neckties, we can't have hoodies, we can't have work coats underneath. You have to get this stuff away from the neck because it has to be against the neck and against the head. Now, yes, let's say he, if he, he couldn't do that and he was in the car, there's a couple of ways that you could either kind of pull it back and stretch it and get the collar around. But like in New England where we're getting, you know, we've got two feet of snow in Boston and I'm missing that like anything. Everybody's going to be in parkas and, um, you know, scarves and uh, turtlenecks and all kinds of stuff. So what do I want? I take out my scissors because we don't cut their clothes off up there because it's cold. But we take the scissors and we go in here. Clip, 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 clip. Down on the shoulder, clip, 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 clip. Roll it back, roll it back, and then we put the collar on. Okay? That's what we do. Or we take the coat off in the car, which is really not a hard thing to do. We don't, we don't cut stuff. You guys do a lot of cutting. We don't cut. We just peel the coat back like this, and we pull it down, and we say, put your hand down here. And so he pulls the sleeve, and out comes the jacket. And then when we go to pull him out, or we'll do this side actually first, because I'm on the wrong side of the car. We pull this sleeve out, and his arm is free. And then when we go to take him out of the car, we just leave the jacket in the car. It just comes off the other side. You cannot put these on with anything underneath them. If you find a lot of jewelry, take it off, put it in their pocket, because that also changes our, the, what we do when we do the CAT scan. So, we're getting ready. I'm going to spin your chair now. If I, had, if I were inside the car, I'm in the passenger seat, and I want to um, put this collar and somebody hands it to me, because I did the measurement, I say, hey, throw me a collar. And for me, three fingers is this third line, and everybody's fingers are different. I lock it in. So whoever's on the outside of the car, what I'm going to be doing is passing the collar that way. So all I'm doing is putting the tab behind the patient. I'm coming underneath the, the chin and I'm grabbing the chin. And by doing that, I can actually then fold this collar in and then I can pull this nice and tight. And by doing that, how I know it's on correct is that it's halfway up his ears. It should cover half the ears. It should come halfway up the back of the head and the chin should be in the cup. I shouldn't have a bunch of space here so that when I, once I get it, this on, can you bend your head forward? Mm -hmm. How about back? Can you go side to side? Little so this, a little bit, but not enough to like make to write home. If I put this on the way everybody else puts it on, you'll see that there's a, a big, oh, there's a big gap and there's this, this huge mess. So if you're not measuring these and putting them on correctly, you're good, we're, gonna have, we're gonna blow our whole uh, C-spine protocol. Now that's this collar. Now with men, when this collar is left in a low position and just put on the way they're supposed to be, and you guys pull them tight, what happens with this is underneath here is this plastic piece that sits against the vocal cords, the Adam's apple. Can you feel that right there? And when you lay him down and, and everything kind of comes forward, that's going to be against that plastic. So when people are going, I can't breathe in this thing, you got to take this off, I can't stand this thing, what they're trying to tell you is, I think you got it on wrong because it really is bothering them. But we, we're like, listen, Relax, you're going to be at the hospital in a half an hour because we're coming in for Bonitot. You'll be all right. You might have to, once you lay them down, just relook and make sure that you don't need an adjustment that you're not choking them. Okay, that's this particular collar. All right. If you find that when you put the collar on, it's, it's not quite getting around, then we, the adjustment you make is you go down one size, one, one block down one thing. The lower the chin goes, the more girth you have. The higher the chin goes, the less girth. So you can be five feet two and you have to put it on the tallest position because they have a tall, thin neck. It has nothing to do with how tall they are. It has to do with how thin their neck is. The taller, the, the smaller the girth. Does that make sense on these collars? Okay. On the lowest scale collars, these, I would throw these out as fast as I could. Now, I have seen people come in with the collar on like this. Is there anything missing? Yeah. Yeah, the damn chin piece. And it didn't occur to them at all. So obviously we know we have a chin piece to start with. Secondly, this has a measuring uh, thing as well. And it's the same thing. 
fingers forward. I got three fingers. Where's my measuring line? It says it right here. It says measuring line. So what I have to do is I have to open this collar, make all four buttons go away, and then basically I'm going to take the three fingers I'm using to measure. This is where it takes 18 people to work this one. And, and this part down the bottom is what lowers. And you're measuring to this point, the hard plastic, on this collar. You're not measuring to the piton on that one. You're measuring to the hard plastic. So three fingers, I have to bring this up until this hard plastic meets my pinky. And once it does, I lock it in, lock it in, lock it in, lock it in. It comes out to the same exact third spot as this spot, this one. So once you kind of know what you're doing, if, you, if you're going to use a three on this one, you use a three on this one. And again, same thing. These do not form as well. I think they're pretty stiff, and I don't think they're terribly comfortable. I mean, he can tell you better because he's going to be in it. But I think the other ones feel better, personally, and they fit better. So making sure, see, so you're a little bit more, and again, you've got to be careful with the ears. The ears need to be in. This, this one might even need to be a little bit more adjusted because I don't. it's not really sitting on the shoulders as much as it should. So this might need to go up just a little bit more. All right, so questions about measuring collars. Fingers forward, starting from the bottom up, how many fingers do you have? Put it on the measuring line and either measure to the hard plastic on here or which hole is open on the blue ones, and that's where you would lock it in. Got it? Thanks for a great model, a neck model, I like it. Um, and once you measure probably five or six of these, after that, you'll get up and you'll go up to somebody and you'll be, okay, three fingers. And you take a collar and you go, boom, boom, boom. Three fingers is going to be the same every single time you measure it for yourself. So every time I do a three finger, it goes to the regular. Every single time. I have two fingers, I go to the short, or one and a half fingers, I go to the short. And then for, you know, somebody with no neck, it's, it's obviously going to be easy. All right. And so this is just to show you that. There are a couple of different collars out there that talk about, um, cervical collars. But these are the two you're using. So anytime you get something new on the truck, it's imperative that you kind of take out the instructions, take a look at it, see how the manufacturer wants it to work. Make sure you understand how it works. One of the things that I find when, I, when I've gone to court in the past for cervical injuries as a, more of a professional witness than a problem is I would watch EMTs get on the, on the uh, thingy and the, the uh, lawyer would say, so you put this collar on? And they say yes. Can you show the jury how it is that you measure these collars? And then you just see the pupils get big and they just break out to a sweat and all of a sudden they're like, well, you know, I, I like, you know, you put the, your hand here and then you kind of take the collar out and, ma and match it and then you kind of just put it on the patient and they say, well, could you be a little more clear on that? And they really look ridiculous and it really doesn't help the case at all. But when you get, get up there and say, yeah, there are two areas that we measure from, and each caller has a distinction in where they want you to mac, you know, match the measurement to in order to lock the chin piece in, and then it needs to be locked in in the, the appropriate setting. When placed, it should be halfway up the ears, halfway up the back of the head. There should be no flexion and extension when the collar is on appropriately. Boom, boom, boom. All of a sudden, the jury's like, all right, this guy knows what he's doing. I don't think it's this. Because you know the shit goes downhill, right? When there's a problem, it starts at the hospital, and the hospital blames it on the... They'll blame it on the doc, who'll blame it on the resident, who'll blame it on the nurse, who'll blame it on the firefighter, who'll blame it on the police, who'll blame it on some guy riding by on a bike, that it's somebody else's fault. It's some, and the problem is, I don't care who puts the collar on. I, I tell the helicopter people the same thing. If you put the collar on and, and the helicopter picks it up and the collar's not right, they need to stop what they're doing and they need to fix things. So if you have an outside company that puts something on that you're working with, or you're taking a patient from a volunteer service,